All right, good morning. Um, welcome to Envisioning a Collective Future for Higher Education. Um, our panelists today, uh, let's start here. I'm going to do the obnoxious New York Times thing of using people's full names, including middle initials, um, whether that's how they like to be referred to or not. You can say um, <clears throat> or James not. H. Shelton III, did I get that right? <laughs> and you are right on point. Uh, <laughs> is uh, Deputy Secretary or second in command of the US Department of Education, which means he has a hand in virtually every issue the department handles. He previously headed the department's Office of Innovation and Improvement. And before that, he was Program Director for Education at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Ames C. McGinnis, Jr. <laughs> Am I on? on? I didn't know. Is a senior associate with the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, a private nonprofit group in Boulder, Colorado. He's worked with uh, university systems in virtually every state. Uh, he specializes in state governance and coordination of higher education, strategic planning, and structuring of university systems, and in particular, the role of governing boards uh, for the big multi-campus systems. Uh, and of course, Nancy Zimfer, Chancellor of the State University of New York, the largest system of higher education in the country, with 64 campuses, 90,000 employees, and 460,000 students. Um, I was looking up whether or not that's more students than some, uh, more than the population of some states, but it's not. It's close. It's close. Right. Um, hers has become a major voice in national debates over the future of higher education, and she chairs the National Association of System Heads. In five years at SUNY, she's made the system operate more like a system, uh, both to control costs and enhance offerings at each of its campuses. Uh, she's gotten SUNY more deeply involved in K-12 schools, and she has overseen a dramatic expansion in online offerings. And finally, Patricia Fagan Greco, uh, is the superintendent of schools in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee. In the last several years under her leadership, this middle-income 4,500 student district has steadily increased the percentage of students taking the ACT and AP exams. And while that usually leads to a drop in scores, her scores have gone up. All right, so each of our panelists is gonna take a few minutes to uh, describe to you the work that they're doing in this area. And Jim, let's start with you. So, I mean, I think the interesting thing about talking about this work is that it's the, the bringing together of work from a lot of different sectors. We're going to hear about K-12 work. We're going to hear about the work that's happening at the university level. And the question is, how do we bring together a very different kind of discipline about recognizing the alignment of these things and how we connect the systems and then using data and evidence to drive the way we make decisions? So there are three things I just want to mention that the federal government is doing in general. The first, and I think the most important, is the work we've done to try and increase the importance of evidence in making decisions about resource allocation and programmatic awards. And so you saw that first in K-12 through the I-3 program. You've seen it most recently in the First in the World program. Um, that emphasis and the infrastructure to do that work at the federal level is only going to increase every institution and every community that invests in figuring out how to do that well will position itself much better to receive funding in the future than, in, than, uh, than others who don't uh, do that discipline. The second thing is that we have recognized the power of place and community in our work um, and uh, what it means to actually try and drive disciplined collective impact work as opposed to collaboration. Um, and so uh, what you've seen through our programs, whether it's Promise Neighborhoods or uh, across the administration and Promise Zones and some of the other things, is trying to bring a real discipline to the work of bringing people together to focus on data around to achieve very specific outcome goals and to do so in a way where there's peer accountability for the folks in the community um, and, uh, and a willingness to make hard decisions about what you're going to continue doing and what you're going to stop. Uh, the third thing is that um, what we recognize is that there is a need for a new infrastructure to support all of this work. Um, the last panel talked a lot about data. Um, and so the Department of Education in particular has been investing in how do we expand the work that we had started with K-12 around the state longitudinal data systems and push for increased connections between the systems that support workforce development, post-secondary, and the K-12 systems, actually all the way back to early learning. Um, and then try and create a context and a culture where not only we're driving more open data um, for use by others, but encouraging others to do the same. 
Uh, so I can talk more about it, but those are the, the big things, I think, that are levers from the federal lever that we need to keep our eyes on that can help to propel this work. Ames? Great, thank you. Uh, I want to make two quick points, and one is about what NCHEMS does, and we probably spend almost three quarters of our time using data in a way that frankly hasn't been just talked about at all here which is really framing the issue in terms of the population and the life chances of the people of the state, and then asking the question, are the resources of that state aligned with ever achieving the goals? So it's very similar to this conversation about health. Remember the triangle where the population was at the top of the table? A lot of the discussion here has been about institutional data, frankly. It's not been about impact. So one of the things we do a lot is lay out for a state the major challenges in terms of the population and also talk about the nature of the goals you're talking about. A state of New York, for example, probably needs around 70% of its population, not 60% of its population with some kind of post-secondary credential. And that need varies all across the state, but that issue we try to portray in every state and, uh, and then ask the question, what are the kind of strategic choices states have to make? And basically, they're very similar to the triangle that you saw on the healthcare issue. There basically is no more money, either from students or from public resources, to achieve these goals. And therefore, you need to think fundamentally differently about how the system is working to achieve the kind of goals you're talking about. And unless you have those data before you, you'll never get an idea of what, what is being missed. Now, just quickly about systems. Systems enroll about 65% of the students, almost 70% of the students in the United States. They are absolutely critical to dealing with this issue. They're going to be here. They're critical dimensions of the system. I would say that a fair high percentage of them are not functioning effectively and aligned with their policies to deal with these issues. And I think the key that, of Nancy's leadership is to realign the functioning of a system so it is not just a group of institutions doing their own thing, but that the collective activity actually has an impact on what are the major issues facing New York. So we can come back and talk about that later. Well, that's a great segue to uh, the challenges we're facing as a, as a system and then the relationship that is evolving between and among systems across the country, which is pretty exciting. So uh, at, at SUNY, I think we got a pretty good grip on our value proposition and our service to the state. Uh, and even beginning to present in a very transparent way, descriptive data about ourselves. But, it really breaks down when you look at this uh, cascading downward of opportunity in New York and around the country where we see such attrition in the education pipeline from really all along, and Pat knows this from entrance into kindergarten throughout, but it's kind of devastating when you see that less than 20% of ninth graders are really ever gonna get to the finish line. And so I think we have to turn up the heat a lot. And I think all the SUNYites in the room know that. And we've been talking about using uh, what we know about our populations in much more strategic ways. Not only is the demographic for high school decreasing, but the unemployability of adults, in fact, 6.9 million adults in New York, to be able to function in a 21st century economy is just like overwhelming. And so I think we do believe that as a system we can move the dial. And over the last 18 months or so, we've been talking about which, which metrics, which opportunities to chase, if you will, using which data, and then most importantly, which interventions? This is the classic question. Which interventions by which interveners right. are going to get the yeah, proper right. outcome? So as Ames said, if you put the 44 systems of public education together in a room that have the statutory authority to uh, I don't want to say mandate change, but achieve change in a significant way. Uh, our latest figures are 75%, so we'll have to right. check this, yeah. make sure it's yeah. right. These 44 systems educate 75% of the baccalaureate population, and that's what's, what's brought to us, uh, I think, as such um, a, sig a significant body of capacity 
we shouldn't just be talking about the students that we now recruit. We gotta talk about the hundreds of thousands of students that we're not recruiting, which is one of the reasons why SUNY is going deep into online delivery systems so that we can add another 100,000 students to our portfolio. But what these systems are doing, which Rebecca Martin talked about in a breakout session yesterday, is that we're putting uh, some, uh, our bets, I guess you would say, on an analysis of some evidence-based interventions that are working in significant ways within one of our systems, and even within one of our systems at several of our campuses. And we've displayed them. It's been a little modest, but competition to say, uh, if predictive analytics is working in Tennessee, could could Maryland and New York think about doing that? Uh, if Quantway Statway is working in six or seven of our community colleges in SUNY, could we take that to scale? And are there other certain very deep interventions around support for students that we know are working that we could take to scale? So in a very modest, I am so humbled by the conversation we had over the last day and a half because there is so much more we have to do, but in a very modest way, this is, uh, thinking at scale, thinking about the immense challenge in this country and how many undereducated students we have in America, which is shameless, we can't have that, and what we as systems, because we have this scalability, can, can do to move that dial. And then there's Menominee Falls. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. I want to actually thank Nancy. She invited me to come two weeks ago. We met again in San Diego. I was presenting at uh, Strive, a Strive Together Network. Why care about Menominee Falls? We're a small school district on the northwest side of the city of Milwaukee. Most of you have heard that there's been a little bit of turbulence in the state of Wisconsin over the last five years. I've been in education, public education, my entire career. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. My married name is Italian. My dad was 100% Irish. And I really am passionate about the change that we can create together um, for students. I graduated with my PhD out of Madison. I did my um, doctorate at the time in the 90s around planning, systems, instructional impact, and policy and education. Part of the challenge that we have, the greatest challenge we have, is the view of our terminal uniqueness. Urban schools view their issues as terminally unique. Education views themselves as terminally unique from the issues in healthcare. Most of us are the largest employers in communities, and we're, we're directly responsible for preparing students to be successful once they transition to you. Part of our challenge is how do we prepare people who are skilled well in discipline area discipline areas to think differently and learn differently about how systems operate. We're applying Lean Six Sigma strategies across all of our operations. We've trained every one of our division directors in Lean. We're using the model for improvement that Tony Bright discussed yesterday in all of our classrooms down to four-year-old kindergarten. Kids do 10 to 15 day learning plans. They identify their goals linked to the standards. They give feedback to the teachers on the strategies that work for them and don't work for them. They monitor their progress and they set, feet, they set input on their next 10 to 15 day learning cycle. At the school and the department level, our process for improvement is on every 45 days. We don't set year long goals. We set 45-day improvement targets. We meet with the school board on camera. We measure what worked and what didn't work. And we change the next PDSA cycle, Plan, Do, Study, Act, on what's made the progress happen, what's happening with our, our kids that are struggling the most, how are we actually realigning our resources from our operations without undermining the safety net of our infrastructure into our core mission around instruction. We're the home of Kohl's Corporate. We're the home of Harley Davidson. We're the third largest manufacturing community in the state. We're a direct partner with Freighter Healthcare System. And we've actually learned a ton from those partners. We talk about innovation, 
We have a really hard time in our profession learning from other industries on how change happens and how to make it stick. That's really going to be part of our charge going forward. We're a $60 million school district, which is actually pretty typical. We're 20% poverty, 20% minority. Most of our homes are three bedroom, one and a half bath ranches built in 1950s. So there's nothing atypical <laughs> about Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. <laughs> so that's the part that our journey is very similar to most communities. Public education educates 88% of the children mm -hmm. in the nation. Vouchers Charter Choice isn't going to solve it, and we're directly responsible for making sure that the kids are going to be successful as they transition. So that's the background. OK. Um, as all of you know, according to uh, ACT, College Board, and others, um, most American students finish high school inadequately prepared for either college or the job market. And I think all of our panelists would agree that there needs to be uh, there need to be solutions that involve higher education more directly in K-12 uh, so that there's something more like a seamless continuum, um, really from pre-K through career in the way we do education. Uh, and some universities have really rallied to try and tackle the problems of preparedness and access that develop years before kids even think about college. Uh, Chancellor Zimfer led one highly praised effort at Cincinnati. Uh, I've reported on how deeply embedded the University of California system has gotten in low-income secondary schools. And there are others out there. But this is not traditionally what colleges and universities have done. And we're in an era of constrained resources, especially for the public college systems. So for all of you, um, my question is, is higher education really equipped to take on what can seem like somebody else's job? And why should it try? Uh, is it simply that otherwise nobody else will? Whew, I was in a debate uh, a couple of weeks ago where I went off on this obligation we have um, because we prepare the teachers who teach the students who come to college ready or not. And I hope, Pat, I know you'll be very candid about what you think higher education needs to do to give you a better product. Um, and some uh, president of a very prestigious university openly said, this is not our core business. And um, it was interesting because this is a Division I university. And what this person said was that um, if I were to take on the challenges of K-12 and help them send us a better product, which unfortunately is too much the view of higher education, that you know, if you give us a better student, we'll give you a better product, um, I'd have to staff up for it. And, and uh, let's see, a day later, I thought of the proper response, uh, <laughs> which was, how do you staff your football team? That's not really your core business. But it may be. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> so I think uh, are, higher education. Are we education, allowed to guess what university you're talking about? Oh, <laughs> no. you need to have a pool of. It could be so many. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but I mean, I just think we're not equipped to think about uh, the role of our institutions and how they're organized to infuse uh, the commitment to the social good that I think we all personally believe in. I, I don't think there's a person who doesn't, but I don't think we know how to get in the game. Ames? I just uh, want to paint a stark picture. Uh, I think, again, with the data, if unless you're engaged not only with the K-12 system, but pay very serious attention to what Melody talked about earlier and look at the data of your state. If you're focused on polishing up the students that are coming through K-12, you're going to have a set of dying institutions in this state. And the major populations that need to be served, which this system and many systems have not served, are the adult population. And there are many adults out there, incidentally, who can need completion. But the overwhelming crisis in this state is the large numbers of young adults in urban areas who actually are performing at the level of fourth to eighth grade at the best, who are absolutely left in the middle of nowhere. They're not touched by adult ed, by workforce programs, and they're drifting around and away. We have to, in fact, realign our resources to make a measurable difference on that. Now, the ironic thing is 
alignment of policy makes a great deal of difference. I want to be fair that what you have a set of federal initiatives, foundation initiatives, one-off activities that are dealing with this collective action of urban areas. We didn't have any talk about anchor institutions, stewardship of place, mm -hmm. all these other things that are part of the thing. It's all sort of bits and pieces. I'm dealing with this in a neighboring state where, in fact, the leading institution on this issue happens to be a major private institution. Actually, Yale University mm -hmm. is doing more in that urban area than any of the public institutions. Mm -hmm. But there are zero incentives in federal policy, in state policy, to actually engage institutions across lines to actually sustain the work. It's all being done by, by foundation bits and pieces. So unless we understand the depth of the problem facing the country, I'll just pick on Connecticut, unless they deal with the urban core problem, they will never get to any 70%. They can do everything they want to do. They can get com completion rates at every four-year institution up to the best performing and move the needle virtually not at all. So that's, that's kind of the challenge you've got. So the truth is, you're going to have to realign your whole higher ed capacity to serve those needs. And that's going to mean some places are going to go away because there's simply not the resources for it. And the role the system has to play is, in fact, to bring those incentives together to make a measurable difference on that population. So I don't think it's a choice. I think anybody says that's not our business. They're, just, uh, they're basically going to say, as a public institution, we, in 20 years, will not be around. I mean, that's as serious as it is. And I'll just I mean, I agree with everything that was just said, and I'll just add two slightly different perspectives. Um, always try to be careful over analyzing, analogizing the business, but there is not a serious corporate competitor that doesn't think about supply chain management. <laughs> that doesn't think about right. how am I working with the people who supply me what I need to produce my product to make sure that what they're giving me is as good as it possibly can be so what I produce in the end is excellent. It is a given as a principle in how you run a successful organization and how you make sure that you're spending your resources as efficiently as possible, that you, that investment has a meaningful return on it. So I will say from that perspective alone, it is a silly question to ask. The second silly part of it is that, sorry, I shouldn't say silly. Um, right. You can tell I'm a short timer now. Um, <laughs> uh, the second part of it is that on most, especially large university campuses that get research dollars, there's a big conversation that's going on about technology transfer. Um, and it happens in schools of engineering and in schools of computer science, where the university is investing in research and trying to figure out how it actually turns that research into things that actually are meaningful to the marketplace that they can actually sell the IP to others to do things, to solve problems, create products. For some reason, that conversation about how you produce things that actually matter and move the needle in the sector that you care about don't seem to be coming to the doors of schools of education and the social sector. Once you actually start to think that you're supposed to, as a university, be producing research and research and development of solutions that are going to move the needle in the sectors that you are, have institutional centers of competence around, then it changes the dynamic of the relationship that you should expect to have with your customers, your districts, your communities that are using your social workers and your teachers, that are using the research that you're doing about childhood development and brain development. All of the things that you think about, about how you do your research and what it's supposed to do when it's, you're done with it, should change to say, how do I use this? Basic research is important, but what part do I play in actually feeding this ecosystem that is about building the human capital of this country by producing research and solutions that actually move the needle? That is another role of universities. It is probably, it is well recognized in almost every other sector of our economy. And yet when we come to the areas where we probably need it most, we somehow let it slip to the side. So you, you've, several of you, uh, of your comments uh, have gotten a, another question I wanted to ask, which I think, um, I think Ms. Greco uh, has a particularly strong view on, and that is, um, you know, we see all these reports about how poorly American students do compared to those in other countries, especially in math and science, about how poorly those subjects are taught in our schools. 
Um, and uh, how a lot of teachers, especially in STEM fields, aren't particularly well versed in their subject. Um, a lot of teachers say that they never receive any training in skills as basic as engaging students or classroom discipline and management. Um, and so the political argument has tended to go, well, we need more resources, smaller classes. No, 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 we need to eliminate tenure and get rid of the bad teachers. Well, no, 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 you can never get better teachers unless you spend a lot more money. Um, but there's very little discussion about our schools of education and how we teach teachers to teach. Um, is that part of the system failing? Well, I want to uh, play into Pat, because she's going to tell us a lot about what we can do better to give you a better in the supply chain. But I do think that, um, I'll just say it this way, shooting fish in a barrel or criticizing teacher education is, is uh, sort of fanciful. Training teachers is an all university responsibility. Every discipline represented in our infrastructure is delivered by a teacher using some discipline, typically in the colleges of arts, sciences, and humanities. And uh, it works uh, pedagogically, but look what we're learning now from our uh, information sciences. We're learning a lot about teaching and learning, and it's not in the ed school, and it's not in the math department. It's really through the people who are interested in the technology of instructional delivery. And so the clarion call for our system that trains or prepares 5,000 teachers a year is first, that it become an all university responsibility. And second, that we set up an infrastructure where Pat and I can work together on the product you need. There is still a great divide in teacher preparation between the universities that prepare and the districts that receive. In fact, it is the case in some of our school districts that because of the high stakes testing, they don't really want our interns in the classroom. I'm sure you don't feel that way because you no. probably think it's two more hands. But we are having a very difficult time providing the clinical learning opportunities for our students because of the pressure of testing that teachers feel. So can we do a better job? You bet. But are we going to continue to shoot at the ed schools? I think that's just not the answer. The answer is university-wide. The answer is system-wide. And we need a lot better state policy that will really connect us in ways where somehow you are supported in taking our clinical opportunities, like hospitals. They have a federal line, and in many states, a line item in the state budget that ensures clinical support for doctors in training. Mm -hmm. We have nothing like that. So tell us what I know I've heard before. Yeah, I, the complexity is great, and we all, we all acknowledge that. I think part of the challenge is you will graduate bachelor degree candidates that we will employ, and within 12 months, half of their evaluation is going to be based on the student performance. When we talk about our students adequately prepared to engage students, how many college students feel engaged in a typical lecture when they're starting their freshman year? The systems aren't built right now to look differently than they did when I started my freshman year in 1978. And that's really part of the greatest challenge we have is we are, we are attempting to shift the macro systems. We test our students every single month with a different large scale measure that's mandated by state law every month. And within that, we also have to have the interim assessments to make sure that the students are making progress. My guess is the vast majority of your faculty have no clue what we're accountable for, how the measures are designed, what the kids are expected to perform, and there's a disconnect between the entrance, entrance exams at each one of your universities and what we have to target, and even having access to those. We will employ teachers you will over-provide in certification areas that we don't need. You will under-provide in the hard-to-fill positions. So the disconnect is in many different areas of the university, making sure that the kids are able to come out of college and be successful, feel that sense of efficacy that their work matters, 
Most of the t statistics will say teachers will actually quit the profession within seven years because they don't feel that sense of connectedness. And part of the challenge is most of the data is indicating we're enrolling the fewest number of kids in education right now because we've mastered the art of bashing teachers across the nation to the highest level I've seen in my career. You know, so blaming isn't really going to shift the system. And we have to actually figure out how to work together in a much more profound way if we're going to intend to have that effect. State of Wisconsin has eliminated unions. State of Wisconsin has eliminated tenure. State of Wisconsin is discussing whether or not the state pension is going to be protected. We're not unique as a state. And they pulled back the reserve funds from the state university system within the last 12 months. So unless we figure out as a nation how to actually come back to the con conversation around common good, if people don't think that this message affects them, quite frankly, they have blinders on that is really going to break down even further our ability to produce the results that we need to produce as a country. I just, uh, I have advantage or disadvantage of being an old beast, and, and therefore I've been through this, and I work for the Education Commission of the States beginning in the 70s, so I've gone through every stage of education reform, I think, known to men or women. And so I could go through the one-off solutions. Let's focus on schools of education, teacher education, better schools, let's do new assessments, let's do this, that. And I think uh, Tony Burke made the point this is not a one-off thing. No. It's really a systemic understanding of the issue. I want to tie it back to the conversation that we've had here. You cannot deal with teacher education in isolation without taking very seriously the quality of undergraduate education at your institutions, across the institutions. Mm -hmm. at virtually every conversation you've had here today about how your institutions are how really having to make a measurable difference on what your students really know and do and look seriously at the question that the assets you have to make a difference are in fact in place now. It's how you use your faculty resources which make a measurable difference with your students. And you have to really think of that uh, in context of what's happening in teacher education. And the second point is that if you look at Cincinnati or Northern Kentucky, the community engagement which takes place occurs across every dimension of those universities. So that undergraduate education is in fact community engagement. It is in fact preparing people to work with schools and to learn in that process. So don't deal with this as an isolated issue. If you're gonna make a difference, you've gotta transform the undergraduate experience so your students are engaged in a way in which they're really making a difference. It's just, it, it drives me absolutely bats to think that we're now, it's, what I faced was an every new governor had a new idea. Well, our policy cycle's pretty you know, short. It's, you gotta see all the pieces right. as they come together. You know, I, I think uh, as much, Jim, as uh, we, look to federal policy to incentivize a change in behavior. You mentioned anchor institutions, and I think at SUNY, with 64 campuses in 64 different communities across the state, within 15 or 20 miles of every New Yorker, as big and bold and global as we see ourselves, our local behavior Makes a big difference. Our ability to partner up with Menominee Falls is really the only way that we can invite ourselves in to the full challenge. And in, in reverse, when, when I was in Milwaukee, we had um, teacher leaders and residents in the university. So it's a two-way street. A clinical experience for faculty in schools or communities or around transportation or healthcare or housing, but uh, we have no place for you in the academy either because we we simply haven't viewed education, even healthcare, and all the people that have been here talking about healthcare. Mm -hmm. They have a clinical exchange. Right. They understand uh, that interaction, and we just uh, don't have the systems. And I think. Uh, what the federal government, the Ed Department, is doing now is trying to incentivize these community relationships, trying to get us to yeah. play well in yeah. the sandbox. So, um, yes, that is, that is definitely the case. You know, the, one of the programs that uh, 
has often been ignored at the department is this program called the Teacher Quality Partnership Program. And it was designed specifically to kind of cultivate these relationships between districts and universities. But it was at a small scale. Um, and frankly, the definitions weren't very rigorous. And so again, this notion of collaboration being very soft and not very outcome oriented um, versus a real collective impact to change the effort to change outcomes. Um, the new set of uh, proposed regulations that are to come out are meant to create the context where this kind of partnership becomes the norm. Mm -hmm. um, where the kind of transparency about what's happening between the, you know, the end user, the school district that has to take the teachers and the systems that's preparing them um, is a lot more clear. Um, and it's not just about accountability, but it's about information and feedback loops to allow continuous improvement on both sides. Um, you know, incentives are only as good as how people respond to them as well, though. Um, and what we're really not good at is figuring out what are the second and third order implications of these things. <laughs> But what I, I do think is important is that because so few systems control so much yeah. that if you make a concerted effort to move in this mm -hmm. direction, then uh, the rest of the field will follow. Yeah. All of the talk about healthcare has me thinking about it. It's, it's the subject I covered before I was doing higher education. And in healthcare, Medicare, and to a lesser extent Medicaid, really drives everything. It sets the policies. It's the single biggest source of dollars in the healthcare system. And it really is sort of looking at things at, in a national way. You talked about not being able to place teachers yep. in schools. Mm -hmm. Medicare pays hospitals mm -hmm. to train <laughs> interns and residents. Right. You talked about uh, having the wrong incentives for people uh, or you know, too few people in one field, too many in another. If that happens in medicine, they raise the reimbursements in yeah endocrinology and lower them in oncology. You know, um, there is sort of a national, it doesn't always work well, but there is sort of a national thinking and strategizing about this with a level of resources uh, and, and an influence on the system that DOE just doesn't have and that all the foundations combined don't have. I, I mean, really, the bulk of what we're talking about happens at the state level. Right. So are we really talking about a need for it's not about you or you, it's about state lawmakers. It's about state policymakers no longer seeing these as two separate things. Well, that is uh, happening. Yeah. Oregon's trying to blur the administrative yeah. regulatory lines. You know other states that are. Yeah, I think, uh, I just want to give maybe two responses on that. I, uh, if you look at systems across the country, and Wisconsin is a good example. <laughs> Say. Their, their tools to deal with these issues are seriously constrained by a state government which maintains most of the controls of, over resource allocation and also most of the controls related and, uh, and also tuition policy. It's not in the system. And secondly, it controls most of the human resource policies. In fact, the negotiations related to collective bargaining agreements are not in the system. They're out of the system. So you have 85% of your resources in people. The flexibility that this campuses ought to have in a responsible way to uh, line your faculty resources with needs, you basically got to take something off the table. Somebody else is dealing with it. I think the healthcare analogy in this, in this conference is, is one of the most helpful things, and it's frightening. Because what you're going to see over time is that a lot of the comprehensive universities are basically going to be like general hospitals of the past. They're no longer going to be. They can't be full service institutions. They're going to have to serve their regions by drawing on the rest of the system to ensure that that region is served. That gets to the collective mm -hmm. impact mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. And what's, so what's happening is because of, of the forces that you're mentioning, the focus on are you serving the population with quality outcomes at the most efficient cost. So the state governments have got to recognize they've got to get out of things. Uh, New York is among the top three or four in the country in terms of maintaining control of things that they should have gotten out of years ago in order to give SUNY the tools to make the kind of changes they need and, and have the campuses do that. Give us some examples. Uh, the, what should they have gotten out of? OK. They should not be collective bargaining on the university employees. 
they should not be controlling purchasing and, and, uh, and those kinds of issues. The state education department should not be using 19th century controls related to program approval that, to that tie things up and snarl. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and the, the community colleges have the benefit of actually three budgeting systems rather than just one. <laughs> so it, it's a, it's a, so you say guys leap and jump, but you got 14 snarls of, of things. So, and then you say to Nancy Zimmer, let's leave this thing. <laughs> Uh, you know, the tools are somewhat limited. You can only steer an elephant by blowing in its ear just to a limited extent. <laughs> Don't underestimate so, Nancy. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I think in time, what's going to happen is SUNY is going to be an entity really focused on serving the students and population of this state and is going to be less a place that runs institutions. And your role is going to be connecting that capacity with the needs of different kinds of students. That's the shift over a period of 10, 15 years. The state government has to help that. And that is a very difficult process because faculty members need to be brought on and engaged in the process of what the future role of the academic profession is. Just uh, don't fruit, do frontal attacks on it. And frankly, that's going to be a campus by campus working through the issue. Uh, so that's the degree of change that has to take place. And right now, you're just in a set of straitjackets and make marginal improvement of something that really needs to change. So, Did you uh, hear yesterday this idea of 4% uh, set aside for innovation? Because I don't think, I think uh, big... most system heads think they're running their campus members. Just to say to the audience, uh, I think our obligation is to set the table through vehicles that help yes. this distribution system work and our um, move toward a much larger enterprise on online education, hybrid mm -hmm. uh, with residential experience or face-to-face -face, is one of those ways where we create a tool that then the campuses, the member campuses can engage in or use. And we got like 15 examples of tools of that magnitude that can help an individual campus do its job. But I was taken by the notion that uh, in order to fundamentally change that, the state's investment might be toward that whatever percentage investment in the innovation, maybe like a loan or uh, just an investment where we can get ourselves to another place. And state policy, I think, we're a state that got rational tuition, right. uh, when, which is the envy of, of many states. And, and we did it through this negotiating a plan that worked for both sides. Are, so, are there any states that are sort of out in front in terms of thinking of public education as a continuum from pre-K through post-bac? I mean, you know, and uh, for instance, aligning teacher training programs with actual real-world needs? Let me give you an example of a state that's done it, and every example you'll give, I can give you 14 um, problems of why it's not working, but let me, so this is an <laughs> idea. I, I think that actually Oregon did a remarkably good job on a, on a goals that are defined as 40-40-20, which basically means that you'll have 100% of the population getting through high school, 40% with an associate degree, and 40% and with, a, with a baccalaureate degree. When you actually analyze the data for Oregon, it's interesting where you have the greatest impact on getting to the goals. And it would be not surprise that early childhood education and getting stu students well prepared for the transition from probably fourth to fifth to sixth grade will make more difference than 40 million other things. Uh, but also, uh, there are other issues uh, that the community colleges are not producing students and getting through to certificates, whereas the four-year institutions are actually doing pretty well. So the idea was to have a set of strategic investments that said, we need to think of a system that way. My experience across the country, it is exceptionally difficult to sustain that kind of systemic thinking. Uh, and the federal government plays a major role in, in, in actually messing that up. They have such a dominant role in K-12 that state ed departments are sort of wired at the hip with race to top and everything like that. And, uh, and the federal government is sort of sees higher ed as off this other thing. Uh, so I just want to make a pitch. You aren't going to be able to do anything at a state level unless you align federal policy, state policy, and 
the institutional system policy to make a difference on these things. That's partly a pitch, and, you know, for you, Jim. I think. Yeah, you yeah. Need to... I'll, I'll try Equal to knock time. that out. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of, of, of what was has been said. I think that um, you are seeing examples of states that are really trying to get this together. Um, I talked about, you know, at the most basic level, this first thing of even connecting the data system so you can see what's happening uh, and start to understand the relationships between between the systems. Um, you're starting to see people not only understand the connection with the alignment of standards and um, making sure that kids are actually ready uh, when they arrived and what happens in terms of the investment that has to be made in developmental ed. Uh, you're starting to see these connections happen and frankly, mm -hmm. the, the importance of the conversation that's happening around the country about the cradle to college and career pathway, mm -hmm. like ideas are important and that idea has taken hold in a way that it, frankly didn't exist before. So I think all of that is good. I, I think I, I agree that we have not figured out how to use our incentive systems to drive the right behaviors to bring wow. the systems together. I think though that uh, it's a very strange world. I mean, you think about um, the fact that we are less than 10%, well, a little bit more nowadays because some of the states have disinvested of K-12. Uh, and yet you say that we're wired at the hip on K-12, um, whereas in higher education, where the percentage of funding that comes from federal, uh, from the federal government, especially now that with direct lending, uh, is a tremendous influence on the entire system. Yeah. Well, could be and should yeah. be, but is not. And so uh, I think that there's a question about what role the federal government will play in driving real behavior change. What I will say is that um, we had misaligned incentives in post-secondary for a long time. Mm -hmm. And what I, that, what I mean is that we've had a fantastic system for increasing access. Um, we are the envy of the world. Mm -hmm. um, we just forgot one thing, completion. Mm -hmm. um, like, there is no built-in incentive system uh, with the way our most important incentive, which is aid, works that favors completion. And so because of that, a lot of other behaviors, mm -hmm. including knowing that you need to be reaching back to the other system right. because they're critical to you being able to actually get students who can complete, um, are out of whack. Now yesterday, for one part of the system, um, there is a, uh, the, uh, the gainful employment rules mm -hmm. put into place. Mm -hmm. And what that says is that, you know, for programs that are designed specifically to get people into careers, if they get into careers, uh, or don't get into careers after they complete. And in either case, they can't pay back their loans or that their loans are a disproportionate share of their income. Then you've kind of failed at that part of your mission. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't deal with a lot of things like what percent of your students did you actually complete it. Right. Um, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do a lot of things, but what it does start to do is for the first time say, the outcomes of your students matter. Now, everybody's really cool with that because it's just on this little for-profit sector over here and nobody really likes those guys very much anyway. Um, I really must be on a short timetable. Um, <laughs> but I mean, the reality is that, um, that everyone in this room should be asking that question about our post-secondary systems mm -hmm. today because that it is coming. Some form of real accountability, real tie of dollars to what happens to the outcomes of your students, real transparency on what's happening in terms of debt levels that your students take on as they complete. Like, that is, that is a reality. If you wait for the federal government to figure out what that ought to look like, shame on you. <laughs> it does not work out so well most of the time uh, that it's very well nuanced. Um, but if you lean in, and I heard about Sam and the others that were just talked mm -hmm. about previously, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to shape all of that well before we get to that point. Again, the contrast to, to healthcare is, is sort of interesting because Medicare has had pay for performance uh, for a long time. And in higher ed, we seem to just be starting to get there. And uh, as you said, it affects the for-profit sector and not, uh, it's not really touching uh, most 
parts of higher ed. Um, you know, and even once we get to a rating system and, and you know, trying to expand on that idea of pay for performance, I don't think it'll speak to the issue of integration with K-12. Well, this would be about the best time in the world to be a governor, if you ask me. Uh, we have laid the groundwork for looking at education mm -hmm. in a much larger context. Uh, the, the, the concern with things like cradle to career or P20 partnerships is it's, it, you know, it's too easy to make it just the rhetoric of the day. And given that all we've heard all day yesterday and today that is that we need what, page, patient urgency? Was that what Melody said? We need to be really worried in the immediate and we need to be patient. The change takes a long time. And so it would help in the description you gave of systems that more of our governors uh, were able to convene the key stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, so that at a state level, maybe difficult at a federal level, uh, I think federal policy and education has always been more challenging, even though medical health care is in many ways as complicated or more complicated. But we have trouble making that policy. But I think um, what's happening to us in SUNY is that we need these integrated players to help us improve the way we prepare teachers and the way we connect with K-12. And so some days when you're waiting for state policy or federal policy to connect, you just do it sort of, you just get the players to your table. So we have a conversation going on right now, uh, which we're calling Teach New York, which is about the revisioning of the way we prepare teachers and how we connect with K-12. And we have the teachers unions at the table and we have the state ed department at the table. We have CUNY at the table. We have the independent colleges in New York at the table. Uh, representatives are our presidents, deans, uh, uh, governance groups, et cetera, and maybe what we really have to do as a system is figure out how to draw on all those resources while we're waiting for a federal policy that binds us. And we are watching very closely the healthcare industry. We'd be crazy. This, I had not heard the phrase heads and beds but it certainly rhymes with butts in seats. <laughs> and I think it's the same thing. And the phenomenon, if you look at the state, the national map of states that have already figured out this probably would work for education, shifting our resources from enrollment to outcomes. I think one of the parallels, and I know that the last two days, I give you, I, I, I want to thank all of you for teasing through um, the complexity of this. The parallels are so great. You take out students, you put in patients. You take out um, nurse managers or, uh, or managers of nursing fields, you've got principals. We've got divisions. The parallels are almost a mirror of one another. The difference is in healthcare, their entire accreditation has aligned to the systemic outcomes that the hospitals are expected to produce. Part of the challenge in education is we aren't thinking as a system, and most of the people trained in education don't have a background in systems thinking. They have a background in content, they have a background in the discipline, but the people who are trying to model the change actually don't have the background in the work of systems improvement. So that actually has to be one of the steps that we take as an industry, and count me skeptical, I can't believe our state policymakers are going to be able to figure this out for us. I don't <laughs> believe anyone is going to be knocking on my door saying, Pat, I've got more resources for you. Hasn't happened in my entire career. Wisconsin has been under revenue limits since 1993, more than 20 years of educational system, and it doesn't keep pace with inflation. We are under performance demands, and we are taking in from every discipline, social work, speech therapy, so it's health sciences, it's letters and sciences, and it's the human services field. None of them talk together as they're preparing the workforce that enters in our doors, but you're responsible for all of them. 
So that ends up being part of the challenge. You left out the business schools. Don't you want us to yes. use our business yes. schools to help on this continuous yeah. improvement? Part, I love that. Part yeah. of the argument is schools of education are inadequate at preparing leaders of education. So you shouldn't have principals trained in schools of ed. You should have them with MBAs. My argument is they need both. They have to understand strong practice. We know more about how students learn than we have ever known in our careers. But they also need to know how to manage systems and people, and not just at a theory level, really at a systems deep change level, and how to do that across an organization. Half of my employees are not certified teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, half of my employees, just as yours, are custodians, mm -hmm. food service workers, professional technical, also a direct parallel to the industry of healthcare. Half of their employees are not nurses and doctors. So that, from, an, from a systems standpoint, we have a lot to learn and we have a lot that we can do differently. I just want to make a quick, I think the, the change which is going to occur uh, that I think will have a really transforming effect is taking the idea of a unified medical record for mm. each student and linking that to federal student aid that in fact your eligibility for aid is really connected with essentially your contributions to a t student's path towards completion in which the providers contributing to that path may be multiple participants. There are too many students who, in fact, are reverse transferring, changing, and using multiple places. Mm -hmm. And the real trick will be, in fact, having a, a student aid system and everything else linked, and information system linked that way. So SUNY is a network of providers, but the real trick will be that any student in any part of the state can draw on resources throughout SUNY in getting that path. But in fact, the institutions will be rewarded towards getting quality outcomes for that student. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence, of, I think, of how the medical care thing. The difference with medical, Medicaid is your providers, a whole lot of them are doctors who are independent. The providers here are faculty who are parts of institutions, who are, in fact are in a collective bargaining agreement, not part of this whole thing. You have much more complex change process. But I think. Uh, one theme of this meeting has been short-term, long-term, mm -hmm. and I think the role of a system has to be to help each of your institutions be outstanding in its own right, and a system can do much more than it historically has done. Uh, really to be concentrated, what can we do to do, it's very much like that uh, submarine yeah. <laughs> analogy. That's one task, but at the other time to work on these systemic issues, and to move so that New York is really prepared to move to the kind of system I'm talking about. And I think, Nancy, you need the leverage with money on the margin mm -hmm. to make things like the collective impact right. in an urban area work, mm -hmm. to help the institutions prepare for an adjustment to this kind of That innovation system. edge that right. keeps us doing what we're doing, but always but, but thinking, in, getting ready right. for this next getting cycle. Getting ready so that you say 10 years from now, SUNY is a transformed place for student learning but it won't be in the first instance. And you need the more tools to be able to do that, so that's. And so I wanna pick up on this, on one of the other differences, because one of the things that's always interesting to me is, um, like there's a set of policymakers who always kind of fall back on business discipline. And there are, there are very certain things that are pretty commonly understood. So for example, it's fairly commonly understood that when you want a significant organizational change, you have to find resources to invest in that transformation process. That the return on that investment, may, it makes it worthwhile to do so. And so you have to put in either stop doing something to come up with resources and or put in new resources to get you to that place. That principle, as it applies to, as far as I can tell, most state legislatures in the country, gets completely ignored. Um, and, and when you look at how budgets are structured, which you all have to live with every day, literally the, print, the, the way the regulations of budgeting work make it almost impossible, even if you wanted to try and save the money to do the investment, you, it is almost impossible to do so. So we are demanding that our systems 
make these significant changes without creating the space and flexibility or yeah, providing the resources right. for that kind of transformation to take place. And, you know, I, I, this is just one of the many ways that, um, that I, I'm starting to just call groups of people like this, like the something for nothing governance people. Like, they, I have a different name that I say when I'm not on stage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this notion that you can have high performing systems, that you can make dramatic change, that you can invest in innovation, and you can do so without ever putting anything in, it's a fraud. Mm -hmm. And yet people are not being held accountable for that, even people who say that they want to bring business discipline to this work. I think one of the other challenges is we, we also, from a, from a view of agility, most K-12 institutions have a set of programmatic standards that we're obligated to meet. Our programmatic standards were designed in 1983 for the state of Wisconsin. How often we have to teach what content area for how many minutes. So to try to attempt to realign resources, we have to keep that part static and try to find the additional revenue to actually provide the development in the area that we need to push. And quite frankly, we can't get waivers from this piece from our State Department or our legislators because the only people who can actually break those expectations are the vouchers and charter schools. The public entities are obligated. So part of the challenge that we have to figure out as a system is we spend $60 million a year. As a leader, I know we have the obligation to realign resources. We have to actually be able to figure out the in interventions that matter most and stop doing some of the things that we're currently doing. But that means we have to break down the current system. And that actually makes, we have to make that more agile. I think we have the topic for our next conference. Um, <laughs> yeah. What the heck is wrong with state policymakers? Um, uh, you said that. But, but uh, um, can I submit a list? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, but I, I do want to throw one question, more question at you, Superintendent Greco, and that is: we talked about uh, teacher education programs. Are there other specific things that? higher ed could be, you could be doing in collaboration with higher ed better than you're able to do it on your own. What would you like to see? Many, and I think part of the challenge is, is and I know that we're beating a dead horse here, I would love us to look at our practice the way healthcare looks at their practice. They look at the cure for cancer differently than we look at how do children with learning disabilities best read how do they best scaffold learning? How do we create the best outcomes? We actually don't look at it as a research body. We look at it as packaged programs. We don't look at it across entities, and that ends up breaking down part of the capacity of school districts. And part, quite frankly, part of the competitive drive that's going across School districts won't share with school districts because they're trying to swap numbers. They're trying to attract children. You know, so that's actually where I believe the fields can actually connect in a deeper way. Having the universities clearly understand we want to partner directly and we want to do it around how to best change the outcomes for children across the entire network that we have available to us. And part of that issue of the terminal uniqueness is really a challenge for us. We're an immediate neighbor to Milwaukee, and it's easier for me to work with the private colleges in our area mm -hmm. than it is the major institutions. And I've only gone to public colleges. So that ends up being part of the issue that we have to figure out as a field. We you know, you can't not say with all these uh, analogies between healthcare and education, what our investment is as a federal government in the basic and applied research 
that can resolve mm -hmm. and unpack the riddles of education and learning. We have not made an investment as a country in the kind of R, D, and D that uh, defines the National Institutes of Health. And we've had a run 30, 40 years ago, you historian, uh, on an institute for educational right. research, right. but we didn't need it. Yeah. NIE and then everything else, yeah. Yeah, so I just, you, you know. go ahead. I just want to go back and I think it's good to focus on K-12. I think the real challenge in this state and for the country is what to do with a large pool of students who have failed in K-12 and are the youth adult population in urban areas. Uh, I just, in a neighboring state, worked hard on developmental ed and, and I think did a good job on sort of embedding developmental ed better and doing much better on handling developmental ed for students who needed some remediation. The biggest problem is the students who didn't move the needle at all. This at fourth and eighth grade and, they're, and there's a tremendous gap. These students have no financial support except if they're on a project. There's no really systemic way to deal with that, uh, with that issue. It is an area where federal and state policy, states put virtually nothing into adult ed, relatively speaking. They minimally match the federal program. The workforce programs tend to be little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's the major challenge. And I think it's partly finding new ways to deal with that. Now, higher ed uh, has some role to play in that. But taking, this is just another wonderful example for SUNY. SUNY has education opportunity centers, and other activities that go on in SUNY that do an outstanding job on that. One of the power of SUNY things, in fact, to link those much more effectively with the community colleges, to make it much right. more systemically. Right. But I, I just want to go back to the point, this state could polish up every graduate of a high school in this state, and it would make a marginal difference on meeting the 70% goal. Okay, you can't get there from here. Mm -hmm. You absolutely must deal with the adult population and the urban core which has failed in high school, okay? The state, in fact, will go down just like the high school graduation of the Anglo population will. That's what's gonna happen because the African American and Hispanic population is simply not achieving in schools and a lot of them are out of school with no way to get a job and get into the labor market. So you've got to have SUNY engaged in that, and I think you need the financial incentives, and a lot of it relates to federal policy. Yeah. Okay, then. It, it, it has been strongly suggested to me that we don't need to go the full 90 minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, if there are no objections, I'm, I'm willing to call it a show. How about that? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia Greco, Nancy Zimfer, Ames McGinnis, and Jim Shelton. Thank you, Richard.